afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Author David Sheff will present um, a myth-shattering look at addiction prevention and treatment based on research. Um, thank you um, for joining us today. Just a few details about today's webinar. If anyone needs captioning right now, there's a link in the, um, in the chat that you can click on and you should be getting captioning. This webinar is being recorded. You'll receive an email with a link to the recording in about a week. Um, during the last 10 to 15 minutes of this webinar, you'll be able to ask David some questions. So everyone is muted automatically when you join the webinar, so you will be using the chat box to ask your questions, and just make sure that you chat your questions to all participants. For those of you who are medical librarians, you can receive one CE credit for attending this webinar. Um, just please complete the evaluation um, at the end. Um, that's required for you to um, receive the credit. The webinar evaluation should appear automatically after you leave the WebEx session, and you'll need the enrollment code, um, which is um, here on the screen, but I'll also put it in the chat box at the very end. And even if you're not receiving credit, we'd love to hear your feedback, so please consider completing an evaluation. I'm your webinar host, Susan Halpin. I'm an education and outreach coordinator for the New England region of the National Network of Libraries of Medicine. My office is located at the University of Massachusetts Medical School in Worcester, Massachusetts. And the picture in this slide was taken this past May at one of David Sheff's speaking events. David was kind enough to chat with me and was so gracious um, to do this webinar for us. So this, that's a picture from that event. So while I move on um, and tell you a little bit about the National Library of Medicine, um, if you would like, we'd love to know who you are. Uh, if you could give us your name and where you're located and what you hope to learn in the chat box, that might be helpful um, to David as he speaks to you today. For those of you not familiar with the National Library of Medicine, I'll briefly explain um, what the NLM is and our health and medical outreach program. So the National Library of Medicine, or NLM for short, is a physical library located on the campus of the National Institute of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. It's the largest biomedical library in the world and one of the federal government's largest providers of digital content. All of the information from the NLM is available online and can be accessed by anyone. There is no cost to use any of our online resources, databases, tools, or websites. The mission of the NLM is to advance the progress of medicine and improve public health by making trustworthy health and medical information accessible to everyone. The NLM carries out its mission through a national network called the NNLM that has more than 7,500 members across the United States. This webinar is pre presented through the New England region, or the NER. There are seven other regions across the country that provide similar outreach with online health and medical information, education and training, and also grant funding opportunities. Those who use our resources form our network. Network members come from many different backgrounds and professions. For example, those registered for this webinar 
today are librarians, healthcare providers, public health professionals, educators, students, researchers, first responders, and members of the general public. Anyone can join the network and receive information about the training we offer, and again, everything we offer is free. The NNLM also provides grant funding to organizations that further um, our mission. So over the past few years, the New England region has funded about $150,000 for substance use disorder related programs and projects in New England. The NNLM network provided training to about 77,000 people last year. NLM provides an extensive amount and a wide variety of information about how to prevent and treat substance use disorder. NLM resources do not contain any advertising. They're written by medical experts and they're updated on a regular basis. You also don't need to make an account to use them. This slide shows two NLM sites that are a good place to start if you're looking for evidence-based health and medical information about addiction or substance use disorder. On the left is a picture of NLM's consumer health website called Medline Plus. The page pictured is what you, would, you will receive if you search for opioid addiction on the homepage of MedlinePlus.gov. On the right is a picture of the NLM opioid addiction and treatment portal, valuable information uh, such as understanding addiction, opioid prescribing, pregnancy, opioid use. Um, those are all topics that are covered in this portal. You will receive links to all of the resources, like those two resources uh, mentioned in this webinar, as part of a comprehensive resource list that will come with the recording link for this webinar. It will take me just about a week um, to send out that recording link to all of you who have registered. Another NLM resource um, that could be related to substance use disorder is Pillbox. And this is a useful online site that provides data and images for prescription over-the-counter homeopathic and veterinary pills marketed in the United States. This, pill, this website helps you identify a pill if you were to find an, an unknown um, tablet. Pillbox contains information about pills such as how they look, their active and inactive ingredients, and conditions that this medication would be used to treat. If you're located in New England and if your organization provides health and wellness programming, you may be interested in the NNLM club kits that your organization can borrow. The book pictured in this slide, Sobriety, is one of the kits you can borrow that's related to addiction. For more information about borrowing a book club kit, you can visit the New England Region website or contact my colleague, Sarah Levin Lederer. <clears throat> it's my honor and pleasure to introduce you to David Schaff. He's the author of several books, including the number one New York Times bestselling memoir, Beautiful Boy. His writing has appeared in the New York Times, New York Times Magazine, Rolling Stone, Wired, and many other publications. David's ongoing research and reporting on the science of addiction has earned him a place on Time Magazine's list of the world's most influential people. David followed the book Beautiful Boy with the book Clean, Overcoming Addiction and Ending America's Greatest Tragedy, which is, which, was also, or which is also a New York Times bestseller. Clean was the result of the years David spent investigating the disease of addiction and America's drug problem, which he sees as the greatest public health challenge of our time. 
And on a personal note, David's book, Clean, was the campus read at, um, at my facility, UMass Medical School, during the fall of 2016. And the research presented by David in this book was instrumental in my personal journey to understand addiction as a disease. In Clean, David shares the information he gathered from interviewing scientists, doctors, counselors, and those who have a substance use disorder and their families. In Clean, I learned about the latest research in psychology, neuroscience, and medicine as they relate to addiction. The Partnership for Drug-Free Kids honored David with a special tribute award in recognition of his voice and leadership for families who are struggling with addiction. And in December of 2019, David will become the first recipient of the American Academy of Addiction, Psychiatry, Arts, and Literature Award. David recently launched the Beautiful Boy Fund devoted to making quality evidence-based treatment available to people who need it and identifying and supporting research to further the field of addiction medicine. Now I'm going to turn the presentation over to David Schaff. Take it away. Um, uh, okay, Susan, um, thank you so much. And I really want to thank the National Library uh, of Medicine um, and everyone who's here today. Um, Susan described who, who is here, and I, um, you guys are all my favorite people. <laughs> people trying to help um, people in, in you know, whatever your, uh, your field is exactly and how you're contributing, and also people who may be here who are here because, you know, you have been affected by addiction or mental illness um, in your family. Uh, you, or your, you, know, you or someone in your family. Um, <clears throat> you know, I guess the only thing I'd add to what Susan said as it relates here is that, you know, everything began for me uh, without planning to get involved in the world of addiction and mental illness. Uh, it happened, I was like, you know, probably most of us who I never, I thought this could, I, I never thought about it. I wasn't thinking that this could happen to our family. And if somebody would have asked me, I would have said there's no way it could happen to our family. Uh, not, you know, not to my son. And yet, uh, I learned the hard way that, uh, indeed, um, this can happen to anyone. Anyone is susceptible to addiction, though some people are more likely to become addicted than others. Um, and then I learned uh, when my son became addicted and his life just spiraled out of control and he almost died many times, I was desperate as a father to try to figure out what I could do to help him. And that's when I... Um, became immersed in the world of addiction treatment and realized what a mess it is and how we are so, you know, ineffective when we're trying to both prevent addiction and treat it. And that, I think, is completely directly related to the crisis that we're in now. Um, there's no predicting how many people uh, who are impacted right now by the addiction crisis, whether it's opioids or other drugs. Um, you know, op opioids obviously are killing more people now than anything else in our, uh, anything else, is, uh, more people under 50 are being, you know, are, are overdose, uh, dying of overdose death than anything else in our country. Um, so, and even as uh, opioids like heroin and meth, and fent uh, heroin and um, fentanyl and pain pills, uh, are killing the most people. There's a rise in the drug of, uh, in the use of um, crystal methamphetamine, which was the drug that my son used mostly, um, and other drugs around the country. It depends where you are. Um, so, you know, we're in crisis. We're losing so many people. And the question that I would ask is, how many people are we losing just because of the nature of the problem? You know, this is something that we are facing in our society and culture, and we just have to uh, resign ourselves. There's nothing we could do, uh, but I don't believe that. I believe that so many of these people's lives would um, would be saved uh, if we were offering the kinds of treatment that we know actually helps instead of treatments that we've offered for decades, uh, because that's all we know, and we have a system in place that um, is really rooted in the old style of thinking about addiction. Um, I was 
oblivious, as I said, first of all, to the idea that somebody we loved, that my son could become addicted. Uh, and the other thing I was oblivious about was um, exactly what addiction is. I did what many people who watch someone become addicted do at first, which is I blame my son. I could not believe that my lovely child, who was, um, you know, this remarkable person, uh, this re moral person, could um, become addicted. I didn't, it was inconceivable when he started to do things that were appalling to me. Uh, first of all, using drugs to the point that they could kill him, but also doing things that, um, like he broke into our home, he broke into our friends' homes, uh, he did many other, you know, illegal activities and uh, was almost arrested, uh, almost thrown in jail, and uh, we were only lucky that, that he didn't. Um, and it didn't make any sense to me. You know, it looks like when somebody uses drugs, it's a choice. It looks like it's a choice made by people who are selfish. They don't care about anyone except for themselves. And what I learned um, is that no one chooses to become addicted. The reason that people do become addicted is that they become ill with uh, a substance use disorder. You know, uh, an expression that did, either didn't exist then, probably didn't even exist, uh, certainly I'd never heard of it. Uh, once I started to be educated in the field of addiction and addiction medicine, and I studied, in order to, to figure out what was going on with my son, I studied, uh, you know, what is addiction? Why are we so inept when it comes to preventing addiction? Can we? Uh, treatment? Why are we treating so few people? Um, that's when I, you know, I immersed myself basically in 10 years of research. I met with treatment providers of every kind. I met with people suffering addiction, their families, researchers who are trying to understand how we can better treat people who are addicted. Um, and I came to understand that um, my son wasn't making a choice, that people who become addicted are not choosing to be addicted, that they are ill. Addiction is an illness. Uh, and the reason that that is critically important is because of the way that we look at and treat people who are making moral, bad moral decisions, you know, who are making decisions that are hurting people, uh, including criminality, uh, we treat them with disdain, with judgment, uh, we punish them. But when we understand that a person is ill, we our, everything changes, our paradigm changes, the way we think about cha them changes, hopefully, and, the, and instead of being um, angry, judgmental, and as I say, punishing them, we embrace them. Uh, we look at them with compassion, and that's what happened with me and my son. Uh, I went from being judgmental, as I said, uh, to being, uh, first of all, it just broke my heart. I have a son who's sick. Uh, he has a very, very serious disease. And then the other piece of it became my path forward. Uh, which became the same path that I would have taken if my son had become addicted or had any other illness. Uh, I would have found the best doctors I could, the best treatment professionals, and embarked on a course that followed the medical model of treatment when, uh, again, we know what to do. We don't take somebody who is sick uh, to places where they reprimand them, where they judge them, where they force contrition on them, where they, you know, make them pray. I mean, that's not the way we treat disease. We treat, treat disease uh, with the best we have uh, from medical science. And so that's um, what I learned. And then I had to learn why we're doing so poorly with that. And I learned that only about 10% of people who need treatment at all get any. Um, right now we've got at least 30 to 28 to 30 million people in this country who uh, have the diagnostic criteria for substance use disorder and many more uh, who are at risk. Uh, and as I said, only 10% of them get any treatment. And of those who do, uh, about two-thirds of them get what I would consider inferior treatment that is not based on science and medicine. It's based on uh, a view that people who become addicted are choosing this and uh, if they're going to get well. Uh, they have to admit that they have this problem and they have to um, do things like, you know, pray and make amends. It sounds like when I say that, that I'm 
against disparaging, you know, what I guess is um, part, I mean, what is part of, of, of 12-step programs, and I'm not, um, because I recognize the fact that many people have been helped by those programs and lives have been saved by programs like that. But I do reject the idea that uh, we had in the past, which was 12-step programs were the only way people could get well. Uh, they had to commit to these programs, they had to follow these steps and all those sort of requirements of those programs and if they were going to get sober and stay sober, and it's just not true. So I am trying to shake things up so we understand that people who are addicted are ill and there are lots and lots of advantages uh, to choosing evidence-based care, uh, which is not exclusive always to 12-step programs, but 12 steps are not a requirement. Uh, they help many people, they're a good support group, uh, but they're not essential. What we want is people uh, who are trained in addiction medicine, and we have few of them, we have too few of them, uh, people who are addiction psychiatrists, psychologists, trained social workers, various other kinds of therapists. Um, that's increasing, but it's increasing very slowly. There was just some research by the American, uh, the American Society of Addiction Medicine that showed that of America's top medical schools, uh, only about 17 percent, uh, fewer than one in five, percent uh, of, um, of those schools offer any courses whatsoever in addiction medicine. So we can't even blame our professionals when people go to them, when I would go to them and ask for help and they wouldn't know what to do or they would give me bad advice uh, because they've never been trained. So it's a cycle. We have to train potential doctors and therapists and psychiatrists and psychologists and others uh, in addiction medicine because addiction medicine is, is a specific brand of those uh, other forms of medicine, of, of general medicine. Um, we have to encourage people to go into those fields. And unfortunately, you know, it's a growth field because there are so many people that are suffering. There are lots of opportunities for people in this field and there's a lot of rewards for people in this field. Uh, if you are in this field right now, you know that it's hard, it's challenging. You know, addiction is a very, very serious and complex illness. But people get well and pe when people get well, you change their lives for the better. I, um, you know, Susan, unless you'd like me to talk more, uh, I'm happy to, but maybe instead it would be great to have a conversation with people who were part of the, you know, the, the webinar and uh, who have questions and uh, we can go from there. Sure. Um, so everyone who's here, if you have a question for David, why don't you put it in the chat box and I will um, monitor that. And David, I have a question for you um, that can get us started with this conversation. So I saw the movie Beautiful Boy and it was, um, it was a really hard movie to watch and I was wondering how difficult it was for you and the members of your family to have your painful story you know, out in the public and um, a movie. It was, uh, you know, what can I say? It was, it was both. I guess what I would say is that it was both terrifying and uh, and wonderful. Um, I'll get back to the wonderful, which, in brief, is that you know more people watch movies than read books, I guess, <laughs> and um, so the message was communicated to many, many more people who wrote to me and who I heard from and I still hear from all the time who watch the movie. Uh, and what they say basically is that they feel less alone because they recognize their own family uh, in the family in the movie. For me personally, it was you know, both terrifying to imagine this coming out and devastating to watch it. Uh, I knew that there were, you know, parts of my son's journey that I didn't know about, that I, weren't, that I wasn't aware of. I knew that, you know, he had suffered in ways that were inconceivable to me. But somehow watching it was harder. Um, it was not harder, of course, when we were in the throes, but it was harder than reading about it. It was harder than talking to Nick about it and hearing his stories. But watching this boy in the movie who, you know, who was Nick in many ways. I mean, he, when Nick was younger, he looked like that actor, Timothy Chalamet. He moved like him. He talked like him. He... His behavior was very similar, so that was um, it was devastating to watch that child spiral out of control to the point where he was going on the internet, learning how to shoot drugs, shooting drugs, 
Uh, it was very um, graphic. Um, and not only that, but to watch the impact on the family, to watch the dad, uh, me, um, you know, to watch the devastation and the impact on the rest of the family. My wife, uh, Karen, you know, we were in it together for 10 years, and it was hell. Uh, there's no way around it. And our younger kids, next little brother and sister, Daisy and Jasper, they were traumatized just like we all were. And it wasn't only because they were worried about their big brother, concerned about him, what had happened to him, where did he go, uh, but also their parents were traumatized, and so our family was. And that's something that people who are in this world uh, either know already uh, or should brace themselves for because this, they talk about this being a family disease, and it is. And the important reason to know that is to know that, first of all, you're not crazy if uh, you are completely freaked out and immobile and impossible to sleep and impossible to function, and also to know that you need help, too. The person who is addicted needs help, uh, and the family needs help, uh, and we learned that the hard way. Um, you know, back to the positive piece of the movie, as I said, it reached a lot of people, and I heard from people who said, um, you know, how did you get into our home? You told our story, you showed our story, and the movie inspired, for instance, kids to write to me and to say, you know, I saw Timothy Chalamet, this amazing actor, playing me, uh, playing them, you know, and I realized that if I did not tell someone, if I did not get help, I was going to lose everything. I was going to be at risk of dying. Uh, I heard the same thing. I heard about families reconciling. People who hadn't spoken to each other in years or decades uh, reaching out because they realized whether it was a child recognizing their parents suffering or a parent realizing that their child was not, was what I had to learn, you know, was not that he was a bad kid making appalling choices, but he was in pain all the time, and you saw that in the movie. I thought that, you know, Steve Carell did an amazing job. You know, when I met him before the movie um, was made, and he was thinking about playing the part, he said he read the script and he read the book, and though he had never experienced addiction himself or in his immediate family, um, you know, he had he was a dad, and he understood the horror of watching your kids descend in something as scary as drug use. And also, he said, by the way, realizing that at a certain point we parents lose our ability to protect our kids. Um, so... Uh, you know, so it was hard. Uh, it was hard and it was gratifying, uh, both. Um, and I could only sit through it one time. Uh, you know, I, I um, uh, as I said, I heard from people, countless people. One time I was sitting on a plane uh, flying across the country and I looked over at the screen of the passenger who was sitting next to me and he was watching Beautiful Boy and I you know, was, um, I just sort of shrunk and read my book and in the meantime, you know, watch the emotion. Um, you know, this guy uh, uh, just broke down and he was crying before it was over. And I know that, uh, you know, most of the people who responded that way responded that way because they were there. They recognized themselves. Right. Right. Oh, that's pretty powerful. So we do have a couple of questions here. Um, the first one comes from Caitlin. What can I, I'm sorry. How did you navigate wanting to help your son but not wanting to support or encourage the addiction? Well, it was a lesson that took me a long time to learn because one of the, what I consider one of the most destructive messages that is infused uh, into the addiction treatment system that we have now um, is that we parents, brothers, sisters, husbands, wives, partners, whoever we are, are complicit in some ways in a person's addiction. Uh, and so therefore, you know, we are enabling them. It's our, you know, we're not allowing them to hit bottom. Um, we are protecting them. Uh, the first thing I would say about that is you know, that's an evil message because that's our job um, to try to help people we love. And there's a scene in the movie that is harder for me to watch than the scene 
in which you know the, the boy, um, my son, was using you know, life life threatening drugs, and that was when the dad I keep calling him the dad. I guess me. When I uh, received a phone call after my son was gone for a while, and I didn't know if he was alive or dead. Uh, and by then we'd been through this for years, and Nick had gone in and out of treatment. I was able to successfully get him in treatment, and not. Um, uh, and, and then he would, you know, be in treatment for a while, and then he would relapse. Uh, and mm -hmm. one of the messages that I kept over and over again was that message that I was enabling him, that I was hurting him, that I had to uh, close the door, essentially, hang up the phone. And in the movie, uh, Steve Carell, you know, a answers the phone. He doesn't know where his son is. He's completely freaked out like I was. That happened. You know, some of the scenes in the movie didn't happen, but that happened. Uh, and I... Uh, did what I was told. Uh, I hung up the phone. Uh, I told Nick, you know, he knew what to do by then, you know, go get help. I couldn't help him. And uh, I was lucky because the next day I heard from him and he was okay. Uh, and he did go back into treatment. But I hear every single day from people who were just like me, they received that message over and over again, and then they got that phone call or uh, knock on the door or whatever it was, and they closed the door, they hung up the phone, and their child or whomever it was went out, relapsed, overdosed, and died. So I believe that that message is killing people. But the complexity is that there are things that we can do that can make it easier and encourage drug use. Um, some of them are obvious. You know, you don't want to give money to somebody who's using drugs. You know, as they say in, um, in some of these treatment centers, I've heard them say, you know, giving money to somebody who is actively addicted is like giving the gun to someone who's suicidal. Um, use that money to, no matter what they tell you, it's for a hotel, it's for um, food. Uh, it might be, but oftentimes it's used for more drugs, and more drugs can kill them. But at the same time, so there, there are behaviors, you know, that we don't want to do. We, but, but at the same time, we don't want a person who's addicted, who's sick, on the streets. So let's say they're acting in ways that are, we can't have them home. You know, people become violent. Uh, it's not safe to be around them, uh, so we can't have them home. And in our case, we have these younger kids, Daisy and Jasper, these younger, you know, younger uh, Nick's little brother and sister, and it was not safe for them to be around. So. What do we do? We, we um, um, should get someone, if we can, sometimes we can't, but if we can, we want to get the person safe. So maybe it means a residential treatment program, if that's an option. Maybe it means a sober living house. Sometimes maybe it just means a program that allows them to live uh, and uh, are they're fed and they get some drug treatment. Uh, we want to do the best we can, but we don't want somebody who's problem, who's sick. Uh, we don't want them to get worse. And if there's anything we can do, we want to intervene. Yeah. All right. We have another question here. Um, what was the best professional advice that you got? Uh, there was a combination of, um, of messages that I got that finally helped that were what I wish we had gotten early. Uh, one of them was that we did have to treat this as an illness. Uh, we could no longer try to punish Nick or send him to programs that were going to shame him and blame him and not offer him the treatment that he needed. The second one was that um, this was critical. We finally learned, again, the hard way. It took us years to find this out. We learned how often people who become addicted have co-occurring mental disorders. So what we finally did after 10 years of this, after Nick almost died uh, 10 times or so, uh, we brought him to an addiction psychiatrist who psychologically put him through psychological tests and it determined that lo and behold, Nick had very serious mental illnesses, uh, he has depression, he has bipolar disorder, he has anxiety disorder. If we had known that way early and got Nick the care he needed for his mental illness as well as his addiction, you know, who knows, he still might have almost died all those times, but maybe not because so much of his drug use, we realized, was related to his suffering from these undiagnosed and untreated conditions. 
Uh, it's prevalent. Uh, it's a piece of much of the treatment system that is ignored. Uh, this likelihood of co-occurring disorders. There's research that proves this. It's not just me. It's not just Nick. Uh, most people who become addicted also have a psychiatric or psychological disorder. Sometimes they have other problems like eating disorders or uh, learning disorders. Oftentimes they've experienced trauma. We need to help with those conditions uh, even as we treat their addiction. So those are two things. You know, um, the other the other piece is that um, addiction isn't cured uh, in 28 days, which is what many treatment programs offer. Some offer even less. Um, detoxing a person is not enough. Uh, this is a complex problem that usually continues over years and years and often decades. So the idea that it's going to be treated in a month is absurd, uh, and yet. Often insurance won't pay for more than a month. Often programs don't offer more than a month. Uh, so I learned that as well. There was a lot more. Uh, there are myths around addiction that a person has to want to get treatment before they can get well. Uh, research has proved that that's not true either. Uh, people who go into treatment who go there for whatever drives them to treatment, either their own choice, uh, somehow their family gets them into treatment, even treatment that's ordered by a court. Uh, they have the same likelihood of getting sober and staying sober if they get good treatment. So I learned all that. Uh, I learned it's not easy, uh, but I learned that a simple, you know, two-word message that should be our mantra if we're trying to sell, help somebody who's sick uh, is don't give up. Mm. Wow. All right, we have several more questions here. Um, so one of um, our participants, says, coming into this without having read the books, um, I would be interested in your take on the addiction research and different approaches found in Scandinavia. I don't know if you're familiar with. I wish I was, but I'm not. But I did, if, if sort of a more general question is, uh, I've read about and studied uh, addiction treatment systems in other countries, in some other countries. I just came back from a month in Canada. Uh, Canada has a lot of serious problems, just like we do. Uh, they do have universal health care, even though it's not perfect, and oftentimes there's waiting lists, but people who have addiction can get treatment. Um, also, Canada is far more open to harm reduction strategies than we are here. Harm reduction strategies include things like offering addiction medicines to people who need them, who people who are sick, uh, particularly opioid addicts, uh, they are increasingly offering safe injection sites, um, sites where people who are addicted can use drugs in a safer environment uh, so that they are, uh, aren't alone, and so they're protected uh, as much as possible from overdose. Um, the big, uh, most dramatic model that I've studied, maybe Scandinavia is different, but um, that I've studied is Portugal. Portugal has a radically different approach, which is the decriminalization of all drugs, uh, which sounds like the legalization of all drugs. It's not that. But what it means is that it recognizing it's a whole system based on the fact that people who are addicted are sick, and so we want to get them treatment. And so if a person, if they commit a violent crime, they still are arrested. Uh, the consequences of their addiction sometimes are horrific and irreversible, um, but if a person's only crime is that they are addicted, that they are, you know, uh, possessing a certain amount of substances, various substances, um, so they're not, you know, big drug dealers, cartel, you know, dealers, um, they're filtered into a system that involves first evaluation. Uh, how bad is the person's problem? Do they have a problem? Are they just using too much? Um, uh, should, can we cut down their use if they are? Um, you know, is there such a thing as recreational use? And if there is, you know, does a person fall into that category or are they at risk from bigger problems? If a person does have signs of addiction, is it early stage addiction and therefore they require uh, early stage treatment or is it serious full-blown addiction and then they require full-blown, you know, serious uh, primary care? 
and then they're directed into that care. Um, that piece is essential. You know, when we talk about decriminalization, it's not a free-for-all. It's that we want to recognize the fact that drug use is a illness and people can die, and so we don't want to have uh, people in jail, which is the radically different approach, and we also don't want to ignore the fact, you know, that people are sick if they have addiction. So the Portugal model uh, is uh, profound, and here is the most profound fact that I learned about what has happened in Portugal. Um, they went from having 1,400 overdose, overdose deaths, how many years ago was it? I don't know exactly, but not that many years ago, 1,400. Last year they had 40. So what they're doing is working, and we should be looking at it as a model, because last year we had 72,000 people die in our country of overdose uh, on drugs. Uh, currently, almost 200 people die every day. Yeah. All right, here's another question for you. Can you name or describe some of the other programs other than 12-step programs? Sure. Um, and they're offered in by treatment professionals if that's what a person needs, meaning a psychiatrist, addiction psychiatrist, or psychologist. Uh, or if a person's use is to the point of it being life-threatening, or if it's a substance use disorder it needs to be treated, uh, there are programs that offer these. Um, okay, where do, you know, where do I start? There are so many. The first one is we have an enormous body of evidence that people who are the most likely to, people to overdose and die uh, from drug use right now who are using opioids, Again, it means if they're using pain pills like Oxycontin, Vicodin, or if they're using heroin, or right now the biggest killer of all is fentanyl. Uh, we know that if that person is put on a medication, uh, possibly methadone, but the medication now that is used most often for a lot of reasons, um, uh, it's safer, more accessible, for people, easier for people, to, doctors can prescribe it um, so people don't have to necessarily go to a methadone clinic, et cetera. Um, if somebody is on that medication, they're twice as likely to stay uh, sober and they're twice as likely to stay alive. Uh, the fact that we don't prescribe um, people who have uh, addiction to opioids, that it's not a universal treatment, to give them buprenorphine, which is the medication, or the brand name is Suboxone. Um, it is appalling. Uh, some of the doctors that I've interviewed just say that that's malpractice because we can save their lives. Um, at that point, some people say, oh, we're allowing them to continue using drugs. Well, people aren't using drugs because they can take a medication that's going to help them if they do become addicted. People who are addicted use drugs because they're addicted. Um, what it does is it saves a life, and when a life is saved, uh, they have the possibility of getting well. So addiction medications is one intervention that works. There is also a whole array of behavioral therapies that also have been shown to work. Uh, they include cognitive behavioral therapy, motivational interviewing, dialectical behavioral therapy, I think that's what it's called, uh, combinations of all things, uh, peer support in treatment programs, whether they're out, outpatient or inpatient programs, uh, basically various kinds of group therapy with follow-up support, uh, people being encouraged to support one another, rely on one another. You know, this is related in some, sometimes to 12 steps and that people get sponsors and they sponsor each other and support each other. Uh, what else? Uh, you know, a lot of times because of the complexity of this disease that is often, and again, in a majority of times related to uh, co-occurring psychological disorders, uh, the treatments that we have for substance use disorders include treatment for addiction, I mean for uh, mental illnesses. So another research piece, um, if a person has both, for example, depression 
and addiction or anxiety disorder and addiction or if they've suffered trauma and they have addiction or if they have, like my son, uh, bipolar disorder and addiction, uh, unless we treat both of them, it's very, very unlikely that they're going to stay sober. And it makes sense. You know, we would get addiction treatment for my son, for Nick. Uh, so he'd get off drugs. Uh, he'd do well in the program for a while, and then he'd be released. But his bipolar disorder and depression were never treated. So those don't go away magically just because someone stops using drugs. And in fact, what happens is uh, Nick was sober, and then he was devastated by his mental illness, uh, whether, you know, the bipolar anxiety, uh, pole, the times when he felt crazy and acted crazy and got himself in, uh, you know, terribly dangerous situations on one hand, and then the other hand was depression so dark that he felt that he, you know, suicidal. He wanted to kill himself. So it's not a surprise that he relapsed then because the one thing that he had learned that could help him, uh, at least for the moment, are drugs. Where, you know, and drugs, of course, made his problems worse. So that is another huge piece of evidence-based treatment that works, which is to attend to co-occurring disorders for people that need them. Uh, there are others. The main thing I feel is to get in the hands of a good addiction specialist uh, who can help figure out what of all of those options and others a person needs. It's important to know that you know this is complex. Uh, addiction is a disease that includes environmental, biological, um, psychological uh, factors, and so, you know, we can't just treat it with one um, uh, size fits all for everyone, so we need to be in the cans of somebody who knows what they're doing and can bring those components together. Sometimes um, a psychologist might recognize that uh, an addiction is co-occurs with other things, and so a psychiatrist has to become involved, medications possibly have to be, I mean, that it's, it's creating a safety net uh, and a whole array of treatments that um, are necessary for any individual. And it has to continue. It doesn't end after a month. It doesn't end after six months. Oftentimes it doesn't end, you know, after years. Uh, psychological problems, including addiction, including a lot of mental illnesses and lifelong conditions that have to be treated, um, which sounds, you know, maybe depressing to people. Um, but Sometimes people get sick with diseases that are chronic and they have to continue to be treated. And, you know, that's okay. If somebody has diabetes, different kinds of heart disease, it's possible that someone has to be on treatment uh, for a lot, many, many years or else even potentially forever. Um, but some diseases are chronic and we have to look at it that way. And that's okay because people who are being treated for addiction who are, uh, who stop using and whatever treatments they're benefiting from help them continue to uh, stay sober, um, their lives are going to be able to improve. They can have, as I said, so, you know, the lives that they've always wanted. Uh, and so maybe they do have to see a psychiatrist or psychologist sometimes. That's what we have to do sometimes when we're sick. Same thing. Maybe we have to be on medications. Uh, same thing. You know, sometimes we have to do that if we're sick. Right. All right. Here's a question that I – haven't seen um, before. The scope of impact that addiction has on the entire family seems to be something that is just now starting to become better understood. Do you think that more supports for children and families who are going through these situations is even something that's on the radar? So, for example, for your younger children and for you and your wife, or is it just the family's responsibility to find their way out after the aftermath? Uh, no. You, you know, the person who wrote this uh, the last time asked for a list of treatments that are alternatives uh, to 12 steps. One of the essential components to treatment is attention to family. Um, we all, you know, again, there's two things about that. One of them is obvious. It's like, um, you know, people don't live in a vacuum. They live in a whole constellation of factors, including their family. And uh, so people who have addiction benefit when their family is treated. And in addition, families are overwhelmed oftentimes and families can be destroyed. So families need treatment too. Um, it took us way, way too long to figure that out for me to understand that. And 
I resisted it even when I did because my first feeling was that, um, you know, no, we were fine. It was Nick that needed help. He was the one who was sick. Uh, but I learned very quickly that that's not true. Addiction is a family disease. We were all ill and we needed help. So finally we did get help. Uh, we relied on a family therapist who was an addiction specialist. Uh, and it can, it was transformative. I can't tell you how powerful and profound it was. It didn't solve our problems, but it allowed us to get support, allowed us to help each other. Uh, it allowed my marriage to survive. I mean, I don't know. People break up. Uh, and I think maybe the most important piece of it for me is that it helped my younger kids who were devastated by their brother's addiction and its impact on our family. So family therapy for us was huge. Um, there are other, uh, you know, some people should be engaged when possible. I mean, some people don't have their families um, possible, present. Uh, some people have alienated their families um, or families have rejected them. Uh, so it's not possible. But when it is, uh, families should be involved in treatment. Now, is that happening? Way, 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 way uh, too rare. But it is happening more and more, and that's partly because of the research that shows that it should be happening. Uh, it also is partly, yeah, it's, I mean, it's all together. Uh, we are understanding the impact on families uh, as this, you know, there's no way to spin the current addiction tr crisis in a positive way. It is a nightmare. Uh, but, you know, because of it, we're talking about it more. Uh, we are insisting on better treatment options for people who we love. Uh, we are recognizing the fact that families are in trouble too, and so programs are often uh, increasingly uh, inc including, you know, addiction, I mean, uh, treatment for families as well. Uh, and as I said, there's a whole movement that is changing. Also, I talked about earlier about the training or the lack of training uh, by uh, treatment professionals or for treatment professionals, uh, and that's changing too. It is uh, as as the recognition of the importance of families in treatment. Um, people who are being trained are being trained in family treatment as well. Uh, oftentimes, programs can have treatment as part of the programs. Oftentimes, uh, it is um, it is uh, you know is necessary for a program to help families uh, get access to treatment, whatever that might be. David, what do you say to those public librarians who um, are involved with um, finding people who have overdosed in the bathrooms of the public library and they feel like, you know, this is not what I signed up for when I wanted to become a librarian? Um, I'm having real difficulty, um, you know, with this aspect of my job. What a good question. Um, it happens all the time. Many of you I don't have to tell that to. Um, so what do you do? Uh, first of all, yeah, you didn't sign up for it. You, you know, <laughs> I would imagine most people who sign up to be librarians have a love of books and a love of learning and they want to help people um, with that. But the reality is, um, you know, fair or not, that's, you know, you, it often, depending on where you are in communities, it can happen a lot where people show up uh, in the library. Uh, I've been in San Francisco, the San Francisco main branch of the San Francisco Library, and I've seen people shooting up and not even in the bathrooms, but even in the library itself. So there are two things uh, I would say. The first one is every library should have, uh, must have, uh, that medication, Narcan, uh, in the library, um, you know, it's called naloxone, and it's available, um, you know, even pharmacies now carry it, but it is critical because that medication will reverse the overdose of a person who is, uh, you know, who's, who's someone who's overdosing on uh, an opioid. Uh, it can save their life while emergency workers come. Uh, every library should have it. Every airline flight should have it. Any school should have it uh, because we never know. I carry it with me all the time. Uh, it's not the be-end-all you know, end -all solution, 
Uh, but fair or not, um, that's the first, um, you know, you want to be able to save lives if you can. Uh, and then hopefully the emergency workers will come and take over at that point. Uh, the other piece of it is uh, a network of, I mean, the ideal, it's hard because it doesn't often ex uh, exist, but the ideal is to have somebody you can call and get support so that this is not, does not fall on the shoulders of, of, of librarians. It falls on the shoulders of the people who are trained uh, in healthcare to intervene, to come and, you know, help a person get into treatment, um, if need treatment. Uh, and it is, you know, it's a delicate balance because we want to help people, but we also want to protect other people um, who are, you know, who are in our library. So it's really, really hard. And one of the things that is happening, and should happen everywhere, but it's happening uh, many places that I've heard, I've spoken to groups, uh, it is, it is, you know, county, county libraries and, and, you know, bigger state, I mean, national organizations getting together to face this problem. You know, what do we do? No one has an easy solution. There's no silver bullet solution. But, um, you know, I think that it is a reality now, and we have to face it. Uh, I wish there was ways that we could help more, that the rest of our community could help more. Uh, it's true of libraries. It's also true of schools. Um, you know, people uh, are overdosing in high schools, uh, in colleges. You know, they need to have Narcan available, and they also need to have intervention so that you know we can help people who need who need it. And thank you, by the way, for those of you who do that work, because it is uh, I've relied on the libraries uh, for all of my books. I love our libraries. I spend time in libraries. I do a lot of my research in libraries. I, you know, sometimes actually work in libraries when I'm traveling. Um, and now, you know, I'm grateful to libraries for taking on this um, this burden, which it really is. It's a burden that should not be on, you know, falling on our libraries. So anyway, so thank you. And I see, Susan, that it's um, it looks like it's time to. So we're going to have to end, so I want to thank you for doing this and, and thank all the people who've been here uh, participating. Well, and thank you so much, David, for giving us your time this afternoon and also sharing, you know, your answers were the work um, that um, you do. So we appreciate that. Um, so for people getting, um, so anyway, David, I have one, one more question for you. There were some um, questions that we didn't get to um, ask you. If I were to email those to you, would you be able to give us some brief answers to those? Absolutely. There were probably, okay, there were probably five or six. All right, All send right. them along, and uh, again, thank you. All right, and um, for those of you who joined us this afternoon, um, thank you for your time. I wanted to point out that we have a couple of um, upcoming webinars you may be interested in. Um, on December 5th, Fred Mensch, who's the president of the Partnership for Drug-Free Kids, is going to be giving a presentation um, about engaging parents and caregivers. And the partnership has a wonderful website that is chock full of resources. So Fred is going to be sharing those free resources um, with all of us in that presentation. On January 30th, we also have um, the person from um, the documentary film Beyond the Wall. Uh, Louis Diaz is going to be talking with us about um, the documentary that was made about his work um, being a substance use disorder um, counselor with the Middlesex DA's office um, here in Massachusetts and the work he does out in the community for those who have formerly been incarcerated and are returning to the community. So that struggles and strategies for survival beyond the walls of um, jail. We also have a special webinar coming up that I haven't um, gotten the link um, so you can register for it. Um, I just haven't had time to do it. But this is about substance use disorder and heredity. 
Um, this is a candid interview with three generations of one family who each generation has been affected by substance use disorder. This is a student from one of our recovery high schools here in Massachusetts. And her father and her grandmother both talk about um, the complexities of um, this disease. So um, keep a lookout for that. All right, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. And um, I will also send you the answers to um, the questions from David. And it looks like, yes, I should send out the evaluation link. So let me just put that in the chat box. It's not, is it here? There it is. So the link and um, the enrollment code is there. All right, and I think that's it. All right, goodbye everybody. Oh, the link doesn't show. Let me try it again. Hey, Susan, are you sending to all participants? Ms. Rebecca. Oh, it's all, so it's all attendees? That's what mm, I. Try, try all participants. I don't know, maybe because I'm not an attendee, I didn't see it. I'm a participant. I mean, I'm a oh, panel. Participants, okay, here we go. Okay, so Freya says she sees it, but it's dead. So let's see what oh. I have. Oh, it's, you've got the short link there. Oh, you know what? It works for me, so I'm not sure why it didn't work for Freya. Oh, okay. Okay, um, so that link should work. Freya, sometimes if you copy, click on it rather than copy and pasting it, because sometimes okay, extra good. gets copied, yeah. Okay, there you go. Great. All right, Rebecca, thank you so much for your help. I appreciate sure. it. No problem, it was great. Okay, so. I'm, and it looks like other people are getting it too. Terrific. Yeah. And I copied okay. everything from the, I, Susan, I copied everything from the chat box. I'll send it to you. There is a way to get it from within WebEx, but I'll just send it to you. Oh, thank you. Okay. All right. Terrific. Good luck. All right. Bye, bye now.